Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to do a review, not only of the COVID-19 scenario in India, but also this whole issue of what is pandemic, what is endemic, particularly as we now have more countries which were in fact ahead of the curve on Omicron, going towards the discussion at least of what is endemic and what is a pandemic. So before we go into that, quick question to you. How do you look at the questions of rise and rapid fall in various states in India? Looking at particularly the urban centers, which of course, as you have discussed with us, are the first to show signs of either fall or rise. So um, clearly, as we've been saying over the past two or three weeks, um, it remains true that there are local outbreaks, particularly in urban areas that are increasingly fueled by Omicron. Uh, this is by no means to suggest that the earlier strains such as Delta have disappeared, but the dominant uh, um, viral lineages now are the Omicron lineages. Um, uh, as an aside, let's keep in mind that the Omicron lineage has also now begun to split into multiple uh, um, substrains, so to say. Um, there is much talk of BA1 and BA2 lineages, BA1B, which was earlier dominant, earlier meaning a month ago dominant, um, BA2 is now beginning to become more and more dominant, and BA1 was relatively easier to recognize, BA2 is relatively less easy to recognize. But the fact of the matter is that at various locations within the country, the Omicron strains are now steadily take, taking over or have already taken over. Associated with this is the fact that some of these local outbreaks in metropolitan India, particularly Mumbai and Delhi, began very early, peaked, and are now clearly going down. Now, the downward trajectories are not as rapid as the upward trajectories, um, and there is noise in them. Delhi's test numbers have fallen, so Delhi's uh, test positivity rates have sort of stabilized or gone up a little, but case numbers being detected are still going down. Hospitalization numbers have not um, gone beyond the abilities of the healthcare systems to deal with so far, um, anywhere that's been reported. Um, however, in other cities, metropolitan areas, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Pune, um, in uh, large parts, the length and breadth of Kerala, case numbers are still going up. And this is essentially the picture that we had expected when we pointed out that this is not going to be a nationwide wave that goes up and comes down. This is going to be local outbreaks sort of merging together into national numbers. So national numbers are still up there, but uh, early outbreaks are going down and late outbreaks are beginning to come up. How much more spread into the, into the rural hinterland will occur and how rapidly that will spread will depend both on chance and on local configurations and therefore it remains to be seen. For instance, in US now, we are beginning to see the number of deaths really catching up with the Delta wave earlier. So is it because the number of unvaccinated immune compromised people are still large and comparatively the death rates in India haven't gone up by that amount. Is it also because it's a younger demography? There are, I think there are a number of reasons for that. Um, I'm a little reluctant to ascribe uh, um, really dramatic values to this in part because as we discussed earlier, case numbers um, are a very um, difficult um, metric to compare. Even in the same country from month to month, case number definitions have been shifting a little bit based on who is being tested, which categories are being tested, how energetically they are being tested and so on and so forth. Um, and since case numbers form the denominator of uh, um, the so-called case fatality rate, um, there is a little bit of uncertainty. Nonetheless, um, if at all it is what seems to the eye uh, does turn out to be correct that uh, American fatalities are a little more prominent one way or another than in other places, 
there can be two or three components to this. One, certainly that like much of the global north, uh, the US has a, an older population. Two, um, like, unlike the global, uh, unlike many other parts of the global north, in the US, the underprivileged communities and the irrational vaccine denying communities are both tightly knit communities with a very with very large proportions of particularly severe illness susceptible comorbid individuals whether because of age or because of other uh, comorbidities diabetes and so on and so forth and as a consequence it's possible to imagine the convergence of all of these being unvaccinated, being elderly, being in tight-knit communities where transmission is very uh, rapid and efficient, having other comorbidities such as diabetes and uh, so on, may be driving the US uh, death prominence higher than in the rest of the global north, perhaps. And of course, the fact that the US still has a very large peak, it's a very, very, the current peak is very large, much higher than the earlier peak. So, of course, not only the, uh, the ratio, but also the numbers of sheer numbers of infected are much larger. So, all of this can go to explain. But we certainly have one good thing to say that, for instance, in Delhi or in Mumbai or in you know Calcutta, we haven't seen the kind of rush that we saw on the hospitals. So we seem to be still, though there is a lag in the uh, deaths in you know, serious cases uh, rising. Uh, there's a lag between the numbers rising and these numbers rising. Still, this seems to be under control, shall we say, uh, as of now. Though we are beginning to hear, of course, you know, friends, relations, old people also dying of COVID at the moment. But leaving that out, Let's come back to what everybody has been talking, which we have not discussed in detail over here. We thought we still have time for it. This talking about what is endemic. And for lay people like us, I have a little bit of a problem that it can be considered that polio is still endemic because we have not eradicated it completely because we still have about 100, 150 cases a year. And flu is also endemic which we can have up to 600,000, 800,000 cases a year. Now, what does endemic mean for lay people like us, not for, shall we say, the medical community or as a subset of that which to which you belong, the immunologists? So um, the term actually does not come from um, immunology and to be honest, um, although I will be castigated for this, many of my friends and colleagues in uh, mainstream classical medicine will be hard put to explain it with any great accuracy because it really does belong to the uh, domain of epidemiology, um, properly speaking. For us, epidemiology and immunology are all very similar. No, they're not. But let's, let's talk about... Um, what the distinction that we are awaiting is, rather than getting into definitions, why are we worrying about a pandemic and how are we going to arrive at the stage that we are going to stop worrying about a pandemic and whether such a situation is to be called endemicity or not? Let's just think about those questions because those are the practical questions rather than worrying about uh, um, pedantic definitions. it belongs to. Okay. So we are worrying about a pandemic for not because this is, not simply because this is a virus that can infect everybody. If it was a virus that can infect everybody, but will not cause anything more than mild illness, we would not even notice the appearance of a new virus. Leave alone, call it a pandemic and get uh, into, into the uh, convoluted conniptions that we've gotten into over the past two years as a global community. So we are not worried about infection in the sense that, the, that a virus, for example, comes into the body, grows, and is transmitted. What we are worrying about 
is when the outcome of this infection frequently enough leads to severe illness and or death. And you will remember uh, almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, there were many people, particularly in the United States of America, that most uh, prominently scientific nation in the world, um, uh, there were many people arguing that, oh, it's just another flu, the former president uh, being, being quite uh, prominent amongst that community. It's just another flu. Why are we worrying about it? And it be steadily became apparent that it was not just another flu for a number of reasons. And therefore, it was reasonable to call it a new pandemic. And the reasons were, number one, it was very easily transmitted because it was a new virus. And therefore, none of us had been exposed. And therefore, all of us were susceptible. First condition. The second issue was that severe illness even amongst identified uh, cases was uh, leading to hospitalization in as many as 10% of the cases. And case fatality rates were certainly higher than case fatality rates for influenza, for example. So the question is, which of these factors will change and needs to change before we stop worrying about this as a pandemic? The first question is transmission changing. And until the Omicron strain appeared, we thought transmission efficiency was going down. Our values, as, as uh, you pointed out in some of our conversations two, three months ago, were going down. But the Omicron transmission has come to the point where our values are still quite high. So transmission of infection is not yet going down. In fact, people are getting infected all over the place. So what is going down? What is going down is the percentage of infected people who are ending up in hospital, and of those, the percentage who are dying. And as this declines steadily, as we have discussed over the past three weeks or so, it makes less and less, it will make less and less sense to identify, to need to identify each and every infected case, because the virus in some strain form or another will be spreading all over the place. But if it ceases to cause severe illness, let alone death, in particularly high frequency, then at that point, we are going to stop worrying about it. And that's one way when the pandemic will be over simply because we'll stop worrying about it. But the virus will not have disappeared. And that's an endemic state. So what you were saying is that A, as, as and when, that transmission either drops or it does not proceed to a very serious case. At least frequency of that really comes down because even today, uh, influenza is a big killer. So it's not that it doesn't kill people and it kills exactly the same kind of people that also COVID kills, even in compromised older population. But as long as those numbers are small, and the transmission does not cause visible impact on us, the body, people, and so on, we can consider that we have reached an endemic stage, at least for our popular audience. If we look at it, then what you're saying is once we stop thinking about it too much, meaning that it doesn't have that kind of an impact on our bodies, or due to transmission, it does not have that kind of an impact on society, or a combination of both. When we come to that stage, we stop worrying about it and we start calling it endemic without bothering when the, the what is a hard boundary between pandemic and endemic, if I understand you correctly. Yes. I, I, let me point out two things. In the first place, this transition is not necessarily because the virus has become mild. We've, we've said this in other contexts repeatedly over the past month, so I'm saying it again. It's, there, it's, there's no clarity that the Omicron strain necessarily causes biologically, intrinsically milder disease or causes severe illness at a much lower frequency. It does so in vaccinated individuals. 
vaccinated or infected people who have been infected earlier. Yes. Because we are no longer, as you put it, a population which has never seen the virus. So exactly. we already have some either natural because of infections or because of vaccination, we have some antibodies now in your body. The distinction is, this is therefore not evidence that the virus has changed. This is therefore evidence that we've changed. First, in fact, there is, in fact, there is some evidence to show that at least it causes the same impact as the original Wuhan virus, as the Americans called it, or Trump called it, did. That the orig original, basically, uh, variants... The 2020 strains. The same. Pardon? The 2020 strains. 2020 strain caused uh, the kind of uh, illness that Omicron is also causing among the, uh, pop the population which has not seen this virus. Correct. So if you have that as a case, then you are likely to see a similar level of uh, intense, you know, of illness. Prabir, there's a couple of issues that I would like to flag as footnotes. Firstly, shifting from pandemic to endemic is not going to be, as you point out, one hard line drawn. It's going to be slow, gradual, number one. Number two, it's going to be different in different places across the world, at different times in different places across the world, over a relatively short period of time, we hope, but nonetheless. And thirdly, it is therefore no guarantee about the future. And this is why I pointed out that so far, the changes in the virus have simply improved its transmissibility, have not made it less unfriendly to us, nor have, have they made it terribly more unfriendly. They've just made it more easily infectable. We've changed, but what we've changed in is our immune responses. So if virus strains arise that are for some odd reason a little bit more dangerous in terms of causing severe illness, even in vaccinated people, then we are going to be back in a pandemic, or if not a pandemic, at least an outbreak situation. So we need to learn the lessons of this pandemic over the long term. And those lessons are twofold. Number one, we need monitoring, we need global cooperation, we need global evidence-based science-driven cooperation, and we need the investments in nonprofit public health that allows us to identify these problems anywhere in the world and to respond to them substantively in accessible ways and means across the world. On that note, we're going to close the discussion, but I leave it to our viewers that next time we are going to discuss one of the key elements of public response that Satyajit talked about, which is vaccination, not only reaching doses to countries, but also the delivery mechanism. Because what we're now saying is large numbers of vaccines are being sent to the countries, which could in future also produce new variants, which then of course would affect everybody else. And we have discussed this earlier. Nobody is safe unless everybody is safe. But not only there's a vaccine inequality there, but also the ability of the health system to reach the, those vaccines to the people. And in which in all of this, there is this war cry by the American pharma uh, companies and their allies that only the mRNA vaccines are good. What the Chinese have done is no good. What the Russians have done is no good. We don't even count. Even AstraZeneca is not mentioned in this in this uh, discussion. Is, is it helping? Can it stop Omicron? It cannot. We only hear about the Russians being bad, the Chinese being bad, almost in a Cold War mode. But the real intent is really pharma markets. And I think that is something we will leave our viewers with, that with Satyajit, our expert on this, will come back next week on this topic. Thank you very much for watching this click do visit us on our website as well.